to uh, Titus chapter number 2 here. Go to Titus and chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2, and then if you would also get Romans chapter 13. Get these, Titus, uh, Titus chapter 2 and Romans 13. And uh, some of you have asked, yeah, we're doing much better this week. I wound up having to go to the doctor because it had gotten deep down into my lungs, so they put me on some antibiotics. But um, it was Joe, Joe and I were joking this morning how that the Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I think what I had, I gave it to Joe, okay? And, 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 and then you got it, yeah. And then Nathan now has it. Nathan texted this morning for a guy, and it's going around, so... So uh, just if, if someone gives it to you, just remember that verse. It's more blessed to give than to receive, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> that's not, maybe in this case, maybe not so much, right? But uh, um, anyway, I appreciate your thoughts and prayers. We weren't able to have any of the Bible studies this week because, uh, because of the issue, but we're, we're hopefully back on track at this point for the studies this week, okay? Look over to Titus chapter number two. We do want to welcome those who are first-time visitors and also welcome those listening by way of the internet and so forth. Uh, Titus chapter number 2, look with me once again at verse 11. We actually read these verses last time and I intended to study this, but we got, got a little off track. Look at uh, Titus 2.11. He says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Now here it is. Uh, these, these two next verses, let's all read these two out loud together. Ready? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we do thank You for passages of scripture such as that are before us now where you continue to encourage our hearts to be looking for that blessed hope. We ask God that as we continue to study a little bit about this this morning that it might be impressed upon our hearts that the fact that each and every day that passes is one day closer to when this event is going to happen. And even though there is not a time schedule relative to the present dispensation of grace, the fact is that your word will come to pass that Christ is coming for us one day, and it could be today. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you as we get going this morning, and that is that when you, uh, when you wake up in the morning, what are some things that go through your mind right, right when you wake up? It's too early, it's too early he says. <laughs> Bad, Bad hair day, okay. What, 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 goes, what goes through your mind when, when you wake up in the morning? Oftentimes you think about all the activities you have to do for the day. I've got to do this and this and this. Billy, by the way, if you don't mind, Billy's going in for surgery tomorrow morning and everything. So, uh, he, so tomorrow morning he's going to go, oh man, today's the day kind of thing, you know. Uh, but whenever you wake up in the morning, there's some things that maybe typically go through your mind. I've got, I've got a suggestion. I've got a suggestion. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, um, if we're still here, by the way. Okay, tomorrow morning when you wake up, I want you to, want you to, 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 to think this first thing, okay? That's what I want you to think. Maybe today, Lord. That, that's why I said if we're still here, because it could be today still, right? <laughs> but think about that. that uh, it's, it's the Apostle Paul, he wrote these documents here. He wrote these books, you know, some 2,000 or so years to go, depending on whose calendar you look at. Uh, but he wrote these books a number of years ago. He wrote these to people who were living, alive. They were members of the body of Christ, people like you and me. He, he wrote these books to them. Like this one he wrote to Titus. Titus was involved in ministry and so forth. Uh, look at something else that he says over in Romans 13. Romans chapter 13. Watch this. Romans chapter 13. Look at verse 11. It, but put a marker in Titus. We're coming right back to that. Look at uh, Romans 13 and start at verse 11. The Apostle Paul says this. He says this, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Think about that. When that verse says, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed, he's talking about their physical deliverance from planet Earth to heaven. 
the actual return of Christ for the, the, the Roman believers there, okay? So he wrote this to people who were alive, actual people like you and me alive that could read these things back there some approximately 2,000 years or so ago, right? It's interesting that he says, and that knowing the time. But wait a minute. In the dispensation, oops, I better move someone's coffee here because otherwise I'm going to spill it. I probably shouldn't put it down there. I'll, I'll put it over here, okay? Um, so in the dispensation of grace, there, there isn't a time schedule. In the prophecy program, there was a time schedule, right? Daniel's, the 70 weeks of Daniel's, there was a time schedule, the end of which was going to be that thousand-year reign of Christ, and then even beyond that, a millennial reign of Christ, and then the eternal reign of Christ. So why would Paul say that in that verse, knowing the time, if in the dispensation of grace we're not on a time schedule? Think about that. Look at what he says at the next verse. He says, verse 12, the night is what? Now, if you far, that phrase far spent, we can all relate to that when we look at our checkbook, right? You're only halfway through the month and you say, why do I have so many checks left at the end of my money? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? The idea of far spent. And that verse says, the night is far spent. We live in the dispensation of grace. Time-wise, it's way past the time when the night should have come and gone. The wrath, the tribulation period, it's way past the time. That, that night time, remember what Christ said, he, he said that he's the light of the world. He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He says, the night cometh. That was going to be the tribulation period. And so what was that tribulation period, it was supposed to begin there in early Acts. Peter said it was the last days. So the return of Christ was to this earth to set up his kingdom, that tribulation period, that, that was supposed to come within their lifetime. Paul writes the book of Romans a number of years after that, at least 20 years after the book of after Acts chapter 2, at least 20, okay? It, 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 he says it's, the night is far spent. It's, it's way past the time when that tribulation period should have come and gone. And if that tribulation period would have come and gone, history would already be beyond the thousand-year reign of Christ and into the eternal reign of Christ. None of us would be alive. So what Paul says, when you think about it that way, he says, knowing the time, what's the time? It's the dispensation of grace. It's not the prophecy program. We're not in the tribulation period, but it's way past the time that that thing should have come, and it didn't come because of the dispensation of grace. But we're living on borrowed time. That's very interesting to think about that, isn't it? And when he says in that verse... That knowing the time, that, now, that, that it's, now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The return of Christ for the body of Christ, if it was truly imminent in Paul's day, and it was. He, if, if we were the Romans and we read that verse, would we believe that it was right to live our life with the expectation that Christ could come in our lifetime for us at the rapture? You see that there? And then similar to the passage there in Titus, when he says, looking for that blessed hope, if we were the people that Titus was ministering to and that Paul wrote that book to and so forth, would it have been right for us as believers to live with the expectation, the possibility that Christ could come in our own lifetimes? Shake your head, yes. When he says, looking for that blessed hope, he's not talking about looking for dying Looking just, well, I'm just going to die. The Lord's not going to come. And he says, looking for that blessed hope, looking for and expecting the turn of Christ in our lifetime. Is that, if that was true for them back then, did I say that right? <laughs> okay. Then is it not more so for us today? How much more so? Not because we're under a time schedule in the dispensation of grace, because you're not under a time schedule in the dispensation of grace. The time schedule that God has for this earth has been suspended. You're not under the prophetic time schedule. In the dispensation of grace, there is no time schedule. It's a dispensation of grace. God's responding to his, he's dealing with this based upon the grace, not a clock. By the way, aren't you thankful for that? Yes. That's really good to know, okay? But either way, we're still instructed to be looking for that blessed hope, to be living in the reality that Christ really could come in our lifetime. Um, some of y'all might have seen that they had quite a to-do about the passing of Billy Graham this week. They laid him out at a state, which this is very, very interesting, that you have just, you know, a civilian, a guy dies, and, and boy, the, I mean, the president was involved and everything. It was quite, quite a scene. And, you know, a lot of people did not like it, <laughs> okay? It made national news and everything. It was on NBC and all this, and, 
And I, I was, um, uh, during one of my breaks in, in the lunchroom that we have there at the office, they actually had it broadcast, na national news. It was pretty interesting. And they had, his daughter was, was preaching, which is kind of interesting, but at any rate, um, his daughter was talking about uh, uh, um, the return of Christ. Now, now, they confuse the rapture and the second coming of Christ kind of thing, but she was really emphasizing that Christ is coming. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And I could say to amen to what she said, but not because of the verse she was, she was pointing to, okay? But what was fascinating to me is how openly and publicly she was talking about the, and the name, the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins and was buried and rose again. And, and I'm saying, amen. <laughs> you know, national public television like that, NBC and CBS and all that kind of thing. And again, you, you had to know that some people were, not, were none too happy about that kind of stuff going out over the airways. And there was President Trump and his wife and some of the heirs on the front row and everything. And, and the, the media's right there. And they couldn't cut away from that, man. It was just going to get them in too much trouble. Th that reminded me of that verse where the Apostle Paul says, um, look how the Apostle Paul says it in Philippians chapter number 1, uh, Philippians 1, 18. He says, what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and I therein to rejoice. Yeah, and real rejoice because that's what's happening. Now, I bring that up to say this, that even though they, as they're, as they're talking about the coming of Christ and they're confusing it with his second coming of the earth, the fact is Christ is coming. Now, I don't know when, but he's coming. I mean, I'm not saying like in two minutes from now, but he could. He could come in 500 years from now. We don't know. The fact is Christ is coming. If you'll turn back with me to the book of Titus there. Look over to Titus chapter number 2. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Look at Titus chapter number 2 once again. Titus 2, he says at verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Is that a true statement? Yes. Listen, and that grace of God that has appeared, that bringing salvation to all men, that's been in effect for, again, depending on which calendar, like approximately 2,000 years or so. That's reality. That's how God has been dealing with humanity. That's reality from heaven to earth today. And then he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Does it do that? Has it taught you that? Mm -hmm. has, the has the grace of God that brought you salvation, has that taught us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts? We shouldn't live based upon the things thinking and the viewpoint and the belief of the world, rather we should live upon the viewpoint, the thinking of God and his word. So we deny in godliness and we're left, we should live soberly, what God says is soberly, righteously, what God says is righteously, and what God says is godly. That's how we should live. So has, so has the grace of God done that for us? Yes or no? Okay, so it sure sounds like verse 11 is true, and, and it sounds like verse 12 is true. So doesn't it imply, therefore, that 13 must also be true? Otherwise, you kind of pick and choose which one I'm going to believe or not believe. See, that verse says, looking for that blessed hope. And the sense of that word looking there is the idea longing for, anticipating, expecting it to happen. That's why I say tomorrow morning when you wake up, don't think about the things that are going to trouble you that day. The Lord Jesus Christ said, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. <laughs> Let that take care of itself kind of thing. When you wake up tomorrow morning and so forth, and you're trying to stir up and get out of bed, and you think, now what did John tell me to remember? What, what, what did the preacher say to remember? How about, Lord, maybe today? Maybe today. Because it's going to happen someday. Some generation of believers is going to go up in the rapture. In fact, all believers are going to go up in the rapture, by the way, right? <laughs> But some generation, the Apostle Paul says, we shall not all sleep. Not all the body of Christ is going to experience physical death. But we're all going to be changed. You know, the, the dentist, I mean, the doctor that's going to be doing the surgery on, on Billy tomorrow morning, you know, he, he goes in there for surgery and everything. And so they put him out and everything. And he's under. And so she's, you know, she's washing her hands or whatever and turns around. And Billy's not there anymore. <laughs> Whoa. What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I did tell them they called me for the procedures, what to expect of that. I said, don't worry about it. If you lose me, I'll be with the Lord. Amen. Did you hear what he said? <laughs> That's awesome. He said to tell, he, he told him, if you lose me, don't worry about it. I'll be with the Lord. What, what a great testimony. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. But think about that. You know, you go to work tomorrow morning, you went there one minute, and you're gone the next. Maybe today, Lord, because it's going to happen. How do we know it's going to happen? Because Say it, Joe. Because God cannot lie. That's how you know it's going to happen. Okay, you know for certain 
that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back for the body of Christ. He's going to come back for you. At some point in history, it has to happen because God's word is at stake. He cannot lie. And Paul wrote this to people who lived a number of years ago, and he led them, therefore, to believe that they should live their life with the anticipation, the expectation to truly be looking for this event to actually happen. He says this, he says, looking for that blessed, what's the next word there? And you know enough, you've heard often enough from grace preachers that when you see the word of hope used by the Apostle Paul, it's not in the sense of, well, I hope my team wins the game kind of a thing. It's the sense of confident expectation that God who promised he cannot lie, so it must come to pass. So we're looking for that blessed Hope, that blessed expectation of Christ to return for us. And if you want to think about it even further, every time the Apostle Paul uses the word hope for the believer, he's talking specifically about the catching away of the body of Christ. We call it the rapture. The catching away of the body of Christ to heaven to be presented to the Father and then the body of Christ placed in the heavenly places. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Christ Jesus, who is our hope. It's all based on him. He's the one that's going to bring it to pass. When that verse says, looking for that blessed hope, and uh, what kind of appearing? The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Notice there's not a comma there. Do you see that there? Jesus Christ is the great God and our Savior. He's the one that's going to bring this to pass. He's the one, verse 14, who did what? The first statement of verse 14, what's it say there? What is that event? That's the cross. When it says, who gave himself for us, that's his first coming. That's the cross of Christ. He says, that he might redeem us from, notice, all iniquity. That's taken us to heaven. See that? That's just not, that, when that verse says that he might redeem us from all iniquity, that, that's not just redeeming us here and now. That's talking about taking us to heaven out of this present evil world. You see what, you see, what, what two events does the Apostle Paul link in verse 14? Who gave himself for us, there's the cross, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, there's his coming for us. See how he links those two events there? Look with me, if you would, to the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians. Look over to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Think about it this way. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. He links those two events. He links the cross of Christ for us with Christ's coming for us in the rapture, that blessed hope. Think about this. Why would he link those two events? Look how he says it here in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, I'm going to start at verse 1, but the verse in particular I'm looking for is verse 5. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. You ever thought about that verse there? How does the word have free course, by the way? How does it do that? When you read it and take, when you have an open heart to it, that's how it has free course. When you read it and take it in, have an open heart to it. Isn't that wonderful? He says, verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Did you know that there are unreasonable and wicked men out there? That's who all of us used to be before we got saved. We were unreasonable and wicked. Okay? And it took the blood of Jesus Christ alone to make any kind of change at all. And the only kind of change that ever happens externally is because of the change he wrought internally. And aren't we thankful to know that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not giving up on you, even though we might give up on him sometimes. Isn't that something? He says, look at verse uh, 2 again. He says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Not not all men are trustworthy. Not everyone's true to their word. Not everyone's going to do what they say. See that? But the Lord is what? Aren't you thankful for that? That ye can trust them. It says, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in who? Listen, if you're going to have confidence in someone, that's who to have confidence in. All the talk in the world out there about self-confidence, it's putting confidence in the wrong place. Have confidence in the Lord, and therefore you know your confidence will stand. Okay? 
You see, the problem with self-confidence is it's self-based. It's self-based. Any problem with that? <laughs> What's the problem with that? <laughs> you know the problem with that. You, you, you try to do something and you fail. <laughs> but when your confidence is in Christ, then it's Calvary-based. It's cross-based. It's finished work of Christ-based. It's His perfection-based. It's who are we in Him-based. So that verse says, And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. Now here it is, verse 5. Watch what he does again. And the Lord direct your hearts into what? What's that? That's the cross. God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When that verse says, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of Christ. He's saying, allow the Lord to take your thinking back to the cross. Is that a good place to let our thinking be taken to? Allow our thinking, allow our hearts to go back to the cross. Allow the Word of God to direct our hearts back to Calvary. Because it's at the cross where I saw the light, the song says, right? It's at the cross where I saw my Savior dying for my sins, where I saw my sins placed upon Him, where I saw Him tasting and experiencing my death, and then where I saw Him looking to me to give me His life as a free gift. It's at the cross. It's at the cross. It's by the cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down over cleansing from sin I cried. That's where He made me whole. It's at the cross. So that when that verse says... The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. We have to allow the Lord to do that. See that? He says, And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. There's the cross. And into the patient waiting for Christ. That's that blessed hope. That's looking for that blessed hope. You see, in both passages, here in the one in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, and the one in Titus 3, you see how he linked the two together? The cross of Christ with the coming of Christ for us. The Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and into the patient waiting of Christ. Why are the two linked? What is it about allowing the Lord to direct our hearts into the love of Christ? That is the cross work of Christ. What does that say about waiting for Christ patiently? What does that say about looking for that blessed hope? What does it say? What's it guarantee? Why you say it is going to happen? Why, why would the cross say it is going to happen? He cannot lie. He cannot lie. Matt, go ahead. Three days later, he was raised. Three days later, he was raised. Good. What else? And, and what you said he cannot lie. Why does the one demand the other? Why? Why does the one demand the other, Marianne? He paid with his own blood, and the claim is that he redeemed us. And he gave, us his life. gave us his life. So why does that demand the other? How come? Yeah, the one guarantees the other. He, Christ wouldn't have given himself on the cross to at some point say, you know, these people are just, they don't appreciate my grace, they don't appreciate me and so forth. I'm just going to abandon them in the end. The one not only demands the other, it guarantees the other. He didn't go to the cross on our behalf for the purpose of abandoning the plan in the end. Because the turnout of the plan or how it's going to turn out is not based upon our fidelity. It's based upon His fidelity. It's based upon God's Word. So that's why when the Apostle Paul links those two, he says, if you ever have any doubt about His coming for us, go back and look at His cross for us. If you ever, have, if you ever lose the idea of Patient waiting for Christ. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> you know, we, come on, Lord, any day now, kind of a thing. Come on. <laughs> yeah, just the, the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the patient waiting for Christ. Okay, Lord, I'll wait, but forget this patience part, kind of a thing, you know. No, he says, if, if the cross of Christ is real, and it is, if what he did on the cross was real, and it was, then the cross guarantees he's going to follow through with the rest of the program. The outcome of the program is not conditioned upon our fidelity. It's conditioned upon whether or not God is true to his word. And what do you think about that? How about he is? Joe, you were going to say something? Exactly. See that verse? The Lord is faithful. Exactly. So go back with me, if you would, to Titus there. 
Titus chapter uh, number 2 there. Go back to Titus chapter number 2. So when the Apostle Paul teaches us to be looking for, truly looking for, it's going to happen. What are you going to think first thing tomorrow morning? Maybe today, Lord. Maybe just, just, hey, Lord, maybe today. Either way, that's a good way to start your day, wouldn't you agree? Either way. Because that, that's, that's kind of like a prayer. You, you're just talking to the Lord, right? So you start your day with a pretty cool prayer. Hey, Lord, maybe today. <laughs> I'm looking for him, Lord. Should I go out my, my front door, open the door, and look out the window? <laughs> you know? What should I do, you know? You, go out, you walk out there in your pajamas, and your neighbors say, what are you doing out here? You really want to know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> kind of thing. I'm looking. He's coming. Say that. When, when that verse says, looking for that blessed hope, what I really wanted to do is this. That was all preaching, but anyway. <laughs> I'm excited, you can tell, and I know you are as well. But it's fascinating to think that the Apostle Paul says, in verse 13, he says, looking for that, what, what does he say there? Blessed. He calls it the blessed hope. The blessed hope. And he goes on to talk about it as the glorious appearing of the great God. Next time you see the bumper sticker says, God is great, you got a verse right there. <laughs> okay? The great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is this why does Paul call it that blessed hope? There must be something about the return of Christ for the body of Christ that makes it specially blessed for the Holy Spirit to have the Apostle Paul described it that way. And I've written seven things down here. I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to just tell you what each of these seven things are. I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll just have to take our time and take you know, seven more weeks to study these, okay? <laughs> kind of a thing. No, I've written down seven things. And, and you, you can go back and you'll find 10 or 20 more. But uh, these are some things that, uh, that I've written down as to why the Apostle Paul, when he refers to the return of Christ for us, he calls it that blessed hope. Number one is, of course, the fact that we will be reunited with loved ones who are in Christ and who already sleep in Jesus. So that's number one. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these in further detail. So number one is that we will be reunited with loved ones who are in Christ who already sleep in Jesus. Anyone here today or listening on the internet, anyone here, do you know anyone that's already with the Lord? Your personal family member, yes. brother, sister, mom, dad, uncle, grandparents, whatever. Everyone here probably knows someone. Um, Bernice, I was thinking about Bernice the other day because uh, you realize, in fact, it was this morning driving in here. If it was not for Bernice, Bernice right back there in the back, okay? I'm putting you on the spot, okay, Bernice? Is that right? She's not sure yet. She hasn't heard what I said, okay? <laughs> okay. If, if, if it wasn't for Bernice and some of the ladies years ago that remained true to God's word, rightly divided, this message of grace, there's the possibility that this ministry wouldn't be here today. So we thank you. I thank Christ in you. We thank the Lord in you. And, and I, I think everyone that was part of that home Bible study that we started years ago, everyone except Bernice is now with the Lord. They're all with the Lord right now. Good, good friends of Bernice and then for us, as we began to have study, they're all with the Lord right now. One of the reasons it's going to be a, a blessed hope because we're going to see them all again. All, all your loved ones that are in Christ, that sleep in Jesus, you're going to see them again. That, that's number one. That, that, that's going to be truly blessed. Number two is that when this event happens, we will receive glorified, changed bodies. We'll receive glorified, changed bodies. How many of you are totally happy and excited and comfortable with living the rest of your life in the body you have right now? Only the young people, right? <laughs> give, give them a few years, right, to rethink this, right? <laughs> Listen, we're going to receive glorified, changed bodies. You notice I didn't say resurrected bodies because only those who sleep in Jesus will receive resurrected bodies. But every member of the body of Christ will receive changed bodies. We'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. But that's number two, the reason why it's a blessed hope. It truly is because you're going to receive a body fashioned like unto the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, guess who we're going to meet in the air? We're going to meet the Lord. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. That, that's got to be one of the greatest reasons of all right there. We're actually going to see the Lord. How many of you have seen the Lord personally? By faith. 
Okay, by, by, by the way, just for a little, those just on the internet, no hand went up, okay? <laughs> right, so, uh, we see him by faith, that's true. We see him by faith in the Word, and, and we see him in each other. We see the Word of God working in each other. But we're actually really and truly going to see the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're actually going to see him one day. The Word of God makes that very, very clear. We're going to be caught up together with them, meeting the Lord in the earth. In the air, and because he's going to be there personally to gather us together. It's a personal meeting with the Lord. It truly is said to be blessed. Number four, number four is that uh, this event is going to take us out of this present evil world. We're no longer going to be in this present evil world. And in connection with that as well, we're no longer going to, going to be in these bodies of this flesh. It has to do with the changed body. What difference will it make that you're no longer living in this present evil evil world what difference will that make lots. yeah lots but what do you mean like what okay yeah one is the biggest the biggest sin in you know, all the, the issue the sin and the rebellion against the believers you know being out of this present world that's going to be something super special that's why it's a blessed event number five is this that this event the blessed hope the catching away of the body of Christ is going to be before the tribulation period. We're not, the body of Christ is not going to go through the 70th week of Daniel. That, that, that's blessed, okay? That's a good thing, right? Wouldn't you say? <laughs> We're not going to go through that tribulation period. That's a wonderful thing to know and to appreciate. And we'll talk some more about that. Number six is that we are going to be presented to the Father holy, and, say it, Joe, holy and without blame. Just stop and think about that. We, we will have been appeared before the judgment seat of Christ, so all the wood, hay, and stubble will have been burned up, so all you'll be left with is gold, silver, precious stones, Therefore, you'll be holding him without blame. And then Christ will take and present you to the Father. Wow, that is pretty amazing. Truly holy and without blame. This is truly going to be a blessed event. And number seven is that at, right after that, we will be actually placed in the heavenly places. We'll be actually placed there in our long home. I'm borrowing a phrase from the Old Testament, okay? A place where we're going to live forever and serve the Lord Jesus Christ forever in those heavenly places. Did we talk about that last Did we talk a little bit last time about heaven? Remember anything about that, heaven? Heaven's a pretty, pretty cool place, okay? <laughs> um, years ago, when Lori and I were dating, we went to a, um, a kind of a Christian conference type of thing, and I remember there was a song that they would sing, and it was called, it was, Heaven is a Wonderful Place, Filled with Glory and Grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face. Um, heaven is a Wonderful Place. And on, on the way back from that conference and everything, we were driving my truck, and we were singing that, singing that song, me and Lori. You, know? <laughs> you know, Heaven's a Wonderful Place, Filled with Glory and Grace. I mean, I, I, knew, I, was, I, I knew I was saved. I, I passed from death into life. I got saved. I got gotten saved before that, but they kind of reinforced some of that. Heaven truly is a wonderful place. And we talked about that last time. Some things about the nature of heaven and how, how wonderful it is and what it's like to really know that you're going to go to heaven to be with the Lord, that heaven is a real place, real atmosphere, real environment. Jesus Christ is in a real place, a real locatable place right now. Just like the earth has longitude and latitude and topography and direction and, 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 and location, heaven's the same type of thing. It's real. Amen. And when you die and you go to be with the Lord, you're going to be in a real place. And then when this ha event happens, we're taken up and we're presented to the Father. And then we're given our job assignments, as they say. And then you're placed in those heavenly places where forever... Every thought, every deed, every word that comes out of your mouth will truly be to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
you can't help but think about this passage in the book of Philippians. We, we, talk, we talked about this. Brother Jordan preached on this at conference. Philippians chapter number 2 here. Look at Philippians chapter number 2. Watch this. Look at Philippians chapter number 2. I'm going to start at verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. He says this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God thought... So he thought, right? Thought it not robbery to be equal. Uh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So in his thinking process, he made himself. There's free choice. There's free will, right? He made. He, he thought, made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant. Was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. Look at that. He's God. But he became man by taking on the form and fashion of a, of a man. See that there? It says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even, what does it say there? The death of the cross. And if you study Paul's epistles, you know when Paul talks about the preaching of the cross, that cruel cross. You go back and you compare some passages in the Old Testament, Psalms 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When that verse says the death of the cross, well, well, the, the two thieves next to him, they also died on the cross, but not this death, not the death of this cross. You see that? When he says even the death of the cross, the death of the wrath of God being poured out upon his, him body, soul, and spirit for the sins of all mankind of all time. That's the death he died. And he did it willingly. He says... At verse 9, wherefore God also hath, watch this, highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That's that passage in Ephesians 1. The name which is above all thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, and might, and every name that's named. That verse says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven. That's where you're going to be. Right? That's where you're going to be. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, what's it say there? Glory. To whose glory? glory? To the glory of God the Father. Look with me over to the book of Colossians chapter number 3 here. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. And on your way, you get 2 Timothy chapter number 2 here. And on your way, go back to Titus chapter number 2 there. Okay? <coughs> okay, 2 Timothy and chapter uh, number 2. You want to have Colossians chapter number 3. You want to have uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. You want to have Titus chapter number 2 once again. Watch this. Start at Titus. Start at Titus. Look at... Look, uh, Titus 2.13, he says this, Looking for that blessed hope and the what kind of appearing? The glorious appearing. Now go with me to Colossians 3. I'll give you a minute there. Look over to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 1, and the particular verse is verse 4. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ. Well, have you been? Yes. If you've trusted Christ, Yes then seek those things which are above. Why? Because that's where you're going to spend eternity. Those heavenly places. He says, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Don't you love that verse? He says, when Christ who is our what? Life. So who is the life? Who is your life? Christ is our life. He says, when Christ who is our life shall appear then, what's the next word? Shall ye also appear with Him where? In glory. One of the reasons Paul calls the return of Christ for us the blessed hope, pardon me, is because you're going to be placed, pardon me, you're going to be placed in those heavenly places in glory to the glory of God the Father. Look over to 2 Timothy chapter number 2 here. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2 at verse 10. 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. He says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. That phrase of the elect, that's the body of Christ, right? That's the believers. 
And he says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with what? Eternal glory. Our salvation program, our salvation package, as it were, it includes eternal glory. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, I'm going to start at verse 6, and the phrase I'm looking for is in verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 says this, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Here it is now, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained when? Before. Unto what? Unto our glory. Before the world began, God had a purpose. That purpose was to glorify His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the heavenly places forever, world without end. Amen. Amen. And the way He purposed and planned on accomplishing that was by creating a new creature, one new man, one new humanity. And that's what you're a part of, that one new man. And He's going to take that one new man and place us in those heavenly places for the purpose of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. That was His plan before the foundation of the world. That's the plan He's going to bring to pass ages to come. And it is in that position, that capacity, being placed in those heavenly places that every thought that you have, everything we say, everything we'll be do, for, forever will be to the glory of of God the Father by way of the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? We have a pretty amazing future. So when I say tomorrow morning when we wake up, let's truly think, Lord, maybe today. <laughs> you know, I understand the things in this life can get us down. You go to work, you have struggles at work, you got to pay bills, that mortgage keeps coming doing every month, right? <laughs> the rent keeps coming doing every month. You know, the, 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 the gas, what? Life happens, you know. You get a flat tire, your car breaks down, the washing machine works, the oven breaks on Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? or, or Easter morning, you know, you got the family coming over and the oven breaks, the refrigerator breaks, what do you do? Life happens. But you know what? What we do is we just, maybe today, Lord, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ forever, I've got this glorious future ahead, and now, I'm an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're privileged to be laborers together with God and live each and every day looking for that blessed hope and then living the, that as a reality because that is reality. So can you see, therefore, why the Apostle Paul referred to this event, it, event as that blessed hope? We're going to see our loved ones again. We're going to receive the glorified, changed bodies. We're going to see the Lord Himself and be with Him forever. We're going to be out of this present world, and it's going to be prior to the tribulation period. We're going to be presented to the Father holy and without blame, and we're going to be placed in those heavenly places where we will, ages to come, the Father's just going to continue to show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can spend some time today uh, really talking a little bit about just introducing the, the, the fact that there's a reason that when you had the Apostle Paul refer to Christ's return for us, that, that you had him refer to it as that blessed hope, and it indeed is. And we ask God as a result of these brief moments that we've taken this morning to look into your word and look at these verses that we indeed might, might each and every day really think and consider maybe today, maybe today, because it's going to be one day, but maybe today. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.